I've had my Evo 9 for 10 years this November, and while it's kind of a staple on the channel now, having driven from Florida to Alaska twice and won a handful of time attack events, it started off with much more humble beginnings. Something that most people don't know is that I didn't even buy this car. My dad did. In 2014, he sent me a picture of the car in a local junkyard. It had been in a collision on the front driver's side and was being sold with a salvage title for, get this, eight thousand dollars. Bear in mind this was 10 years ago, but still, for an Evo MR that wasn't even 10 years old at the time, even I knew this was a steal. I begged my dad to buy it, and he did. Then I convinced him to trade me for my running Mazda Speed 6. You could call this the worst trade in history, but I call it evidence that my dad loves me. I feel like this is not supposed to be a thing. I bought OEM Enkis and found OEM used suspension from real adult Evo owners who actually had the money to modify these cars. In Virginia, you have to have a state trooper come and inspect your car to get it switched from a salvage title to a rebuilt one, and that's what happened. Finally, I could drive the Evo. And that's what I did for three years. I just drove it around as a stock daily. I got it with 72,298 miles on it, and they slowly ticked up. This is basically a stock Evo 9 MR, and the purpose of introducing it to you guys today is I might want to start doing some work to it in the future. And I would love to put that stuff on the channel, but in order for that to happen, you guys need to meet her first. So, this is Lana. This video will be partially a building my Evo in X number of minutes, partially a how much did I spend building my Evo, and partially a guide to building the Ultimate Street Class Evo 9. This is the timecode for the final figure on cost, and this is the timecode where I show you how to build the ultimate street class Evo while only buying things once. In 2017, I went to a Megan downpipe. We're welding a bung onto this downpipe, and I haven't welded in a while, so this is gonna be interesting. We're gonna drill a hole right on the top here, and weld on that bung. I also installed AEM gauges for oil, boost, and AFR, as well as a Walro 255 and Grimspeed three port boost controller, and these are all still on the car to this day. I will try and let you know when a part is still on the car because so much stuff has been swapped on and off over the years. The fading and flaking OEM red Brembos were powder coated Playboy blue and the car got a JDM rear bumper and SE lip. The rear bumpers were discontinued last year by Mitsubishi which caused the price to shoot up dramatically. At the time this one was 600 bucks. I got the car tuned by my good friend Germain at Turbo XS where it made 336 wheel horsepower and 315 pound feet of torque at 23 PSI. I just wanted something nice and conservative. Stock boost pressure on these cars is 21 PSI, but with the corrected fueling and timing and freer flowing exhaust, 300 plus horsepower, no problem at nearly stock boost. I just cannot sing the praises of Jermaine and Turbo XS enough. I'm so thrilled. I can't put that in the <laughs> I can't put that in the video. 2018 saw our first track day, which influenced the direction in which most of the Evo build would develop. For reference, I did a two minute 32 second lap around VIR full. Just keep that time in mind for later. At this point, we took our first road trip from Florida to Alaska, and the Evo gave us no problems with this trip, except when I drag raced Ben's Forster and my stock clutch finally gave up. I had to limp the car back to Minnesota and get the clutch changed for another stock unit at RS Motors. This would not be the last time they would work on my car. Upon getting back, I installed my set of Fortunato 510 coilovers. Until this point, the car has been on stock suspension or lowering springs. Now we've got proper suspension. The suspension is about 24 pounds lighter than stock as well, and we've gone with some street-friendly 9K front 9K rear spring rates. These 510s are still on the Evo. I've swapped the rear spring rates a couple of times since I started tracking more. They're now at 9K, 12K spring rates respectively. In the interest of keeping both my engine and air cool, I upgrade the radiator and intercooler from stock to a coil rad. This plastic end tank on the metal core, stuff like that can often fail just when things start to get old and hot. And Turbo XS 3.5 inch intercooler. You're getting more surface area and also more cooling capacity with the extra thickness. We are going from this OEM lower intercooler pipe to this MA Performance. And this pipe has been dynoed to show like 10 horsepower in gain at least. I bought my first set of wide wheels for the Evo, some 17 by 9.5 plus 38 offset RPF ones. I also ran my first set of 255 with tires, some Hankook RS4s, which helped me PB at VIR. Yeah! 215, baby! 215, baby! Woo! Woo! Hell yeah! 
it's 2020 now and I'm going to compete in Grid Life Street Class, which means the Evo needs some major upgrades if I want to be competitive. So we're going to see what it makes now on this dyno, on a two-year-old tune or something like that. That way we'll be able to compare it once we've done all the modifications we're going to do. On Ron Solomon's Mustang dyno, this equates to 309 horsepower. Our benchmark. What we did in 2020 was not a fully optimized build. That happened in 2022, but with a few minor changes to what we did here, you can have a track weapon for not too much money. The big things we wanted to do for the car were cams and E85. Those would be the big power adders, but we had a load of secondary mods, first of which was an exhaust upgrade. At this point, the car has been running the Megan downpipe that we installed three or four years ago. It's the best looking part of this, yeah. for sure. And a big Busher JDM length cap back. This is a uh, NVIDIA downpipe. I'd say this is just about the same as the Megan. A downpipe is just a piece of metal. As long as it's three inches wide and doesn't touch your center diff, it's probably fine. An MAP high flow cap. The bigger change is the cap back, which is a three inch titanium Tomei unit which is to date my favorite exhaust on the Evo. The sound is absolutely diabolical. We got GSC S2 cams and Beehive valve springs from MA Performance. This is the same head setup that my car is still running to this day, and the next upgrades are ARP head studs, which are basically the bread and butter of while we're in their mods. The stock O2 housing gets replaced with an NVIDIA 3-inch O2 housing, which is critical for increasing flow and reducing back pressure, which is very good on turbo cars, as we'll soon see. RS Motors swaps my clutch for the second time, now with an actual upgrade, an Exidy HD Twin Disc clutch. I think this is my favorite aftermarket clutch to drive. It feels basically like stock, very drivable, and with double the friction material, it's good for lots of power. Now, regrettably, I stayed with stock upper intercooler pipes and the blow-off valve simply because the battery wouldn't fit the upper intercooler pipes we had. This would later prove to be a problem, but for now, Ron mods the stock BOV. The old stock turbo goes back on because Gridlife at the time did not allow turbo upgrades, but we do switch to a force performance cast header, thermal coated, and importantly, not cracked like my OEM unit. Cast headers are less sexy than the crazy welded tubular manifolds you see, but for a build like this, they're exactly what you need and very sturdy. The short runners are ideal for building maximum spool speed, and on a car built for the circuit track, this is essential. We upgrade to Fuel Injector Clinic 1200cc injectors. The larger injectors are necessary because we're going to E85, which requires a much higher volume of fuel versus air to reach stoichiometry. But horsepower mods aren't even the most significant changes made to the car in our Grid Life 2020 prep. If you recall, the Evo was wrecked when I got it six years ago at this point, and while I changed all the suspension and the car was able to be aligned properly, the frame has never been perfectly straight. The next door frame shop, JB Auto Repair, is able to straighten the frame and install a new straight front subframe in about 45 minutes. Easy. Fundamentally changing the handling and subconscious value of my car in under an hour. The car also received its first drivetrain upgrade, a rear diff, which will cause the car to transmit power to the rear wheels more effectively and rotate on throttle with gusto. With the OEM clutch arrangement on the Evo 8 and 9 rear diffs, the cars are very understeer prone and you can't really get the rear to rotate unless you're really screwing up. On the suspension side, we install a slew of white line parts, including their adjustable 26 millimeter rear roll bar and end links and roll center correcting ball joints to help slightly correct the Evo suspension geometry to compensate for the car being lower than stock. It's not a true fix, which we'll explore in 2022, but it's a good piece if you're just lowering the car slightly. I'm done with pump gas. Goal is just to beat your old tune, right? Uh, 320 horse and 316 torque. All of this is coming 600 RPM sooner because the wastegate preload had loosened over all the years and was allowing a boost leak. E85 is another animal entirely. I just turned your Evo into an Evo. Wasn't an Evo before. Maybe it was just a Lancer. On our second tune, Ron is able to make 365 wheel horsepower and 365 wheel torque 
only at 25 PSI, which is the most boost grid life allowed for street class cars at the time. It's obvious that we're tapped out on airflow through our little stock turbo, and barring further back pressure alleviation or an increase in compression, we can't make much more than 365 horsepower in this form. What we've got is essentially a 55 horsepower gain with just the addition of cams, exhaust flow, and fueling, and the cams are probably not essential to that combo. Here started my addiction to Advan wheels, which I've had a few sets of on the Evo over the years. We did a small battery from Anti-Gravity Racing, which shaved legitimately over 30 pounds over the stock size battery. Unfortunately, my first grid life event at Mid-Ohio went very poorly because of my issues keeping the stock upper intercooler pipes from blowing off. These are obviously old pipes and not silicone, so they don't have enough grip to cope with the 25 PSI sustained around the lap. These are the obvious next upgrade, but unfortunately my next track day at VIR results in engine knock. How did this happen? The 4G63 is very sensitive to oil starvation under lateral G-load, especially sustained right-handers. Some people use a Moroso expanded oil pan, or a race fab oil pan, or a dry sump. Even more people use the stock oil pan, which is what I was using. If you're on the stock oil pan, top off the oil with an extra quart before the track day. Unfortunately, I was one quart low, so the engine failure was fully my fault. Yep, it's piston, sir. Oh, it froze. See how it's not moving at all? This one's stuck. The next thing that will happen from here is this will seize up, and then it will just throw a rod out the block. At this point, Ron sold me his high compression built motor, a two liter with 10 to one compression pistons, signs rods, and a stock crank, which is usually the one you want. While we were there, we fitted my head with Kigley HLAs. The Kigley is a mod that is ubiquitous across most modified DSMs and just limits oil pressure to the hydraulic lash adjuster to 15 PSI, which means more oil stays in the oil pan. Speaking of the oil pan, I got a modified expanded stock oil pan with trap doors to try and keep the oil more near the sump. These are super common on track 4G63s, but they're kind of a band-aid and still see oil pressure drops on track. We combine this with an Aki sump, which is a two-quart oil container that senses oil pressure in the engine and sends its supply of oil to the sump when oil pressure drops below, in my case, 50 PSI. This is also a band-aid, but two band-aids are better than one. Set trap oil cooler, check. Auto power half gauge, check. Short ram intake and upper intercooler charge pipes, check. With the new block, we go back on the dyno and make a whopping 397 wheel horsepower on a Mustang dyno with a stock turbo. We didn't even change anything except the compression. This has obviously had a huge effect on the horsepower output without changing boost pressure. For a class that has a cap on turbos and boost pressure, changing compression is a huge hack. This is insane too. And boy, is it potent. My first trip back to VIR yields a 2.08 lap time. Doing a 2.08 on a stock seat and seat belt is maybe questionable, so I swapped for a Bride Z3 wide bucket seat with race quick five point harnesses. But a new problem has now reared its head, pushing oil out of the head. Crankcase pressure is nothing new for 4G63 guys, but with track evos, it's the lateral G that creates issues. This problem is exacerbated even further on a built block, which changes the ring gap from factory, and it's even worse with high compression pistons. Every single track evo with a built block that I'm aware of pushes oil and fills catch cans like crazy. There are a couple options. First is a dry sump. This solves the oil starving issues the stock wet sump suffers, and also reduces crankcase pressure by putting the block under constant suck. But it's expensive, and if any of the aftermarket components fail, your engine has no oiling. Instead, I went with a fix that actually didn't fix anything. Catch cans. My first catch can was a cool STM transmission mounted unit that looked sexy and filled in half a lap. I've filled my catch can all the way to the top and it's now coming out of the breathers. My second catch can was a Powerade bottle with a breather. It also didn't work and dripped oil around NCM on my way to third place there. My first grid life podium. Unfortunately, I also managed to cut one of my prized Advan GTs in half at that event. Looks great. 
This bizarre failure occurred because my brake caliper bolts backed out, allowing the caliper to swing forward under braking and grind along the inner barrel of my wheel. Luckily, my fellow Evo competitor Luca had a pair of Volt T37s in the exact same size at the event, and he sold them to me, allowing me to continue competing in place. Several more grid life events and catch can revisions yielded similar results, respectively. My first time at Gingerman, I managed a fourth place and overfilled the catch can every session. By now, I was running a catch can system that literally went all the way into my trunk with three catch cans. The oil was now contained, but the issue remained that my engine was literally losing oil over the course of a session. My return to mid-Ohio went much better this time. I went an embarrassing eight seconds faster than last year and also ran a new set of advance, the 10 and a half inch Advan RG3s for my RX-7. These are 10 and a half inch wheels, which is honestly optimal for a 255 width tire, but hard to fit under an Evo. They fit, barely, under rolled and pulled fenders, and they allow a wide enough seat to reduce tire deflection. Unfortunately, my final event of the 2021 season saw my first major drivetrain failure. My fourth gear just exploded. The 6 speed transmission in the Evo 8 and 9 MR is notorious for being very fragile compared to the 5 speed. In the interest of finishing out the competition for the weekend, we pulled the transmission and replaced it with a nice reworked 6 speed from Team Rip Engineering, my second TRE drivetrain component after my rear diff. The issue with me going fast now is a lack of seat time. This is due to the car filling catch cans, which requires me to run short sessions. So we must find a fix for this in the off season. But now we get to the biggest changes we'll make to the car for track competition, at least so far. In 2022, I was hot off two years of middling grid life results, and I was tired of playing around. I started with drivetrain improvements. Till now, the car has been using a stock helical front diff. We upgraded to a Cusco one-way front diff. One way. We don't want any influence from the limited slip differential during corner entry when you're downshifting, because that will want to jerk the steering wheel to try to center. The car's gonna wanna try to pull itself back straight. This is a huge mod for any track Evo, and I should've done it sooner. Next, we were back at RS Motors for more horsepower and suspension mods. A corrected 385 wheel horsepower baseline run revealed that the engine was still healthy and gave us a benchmark to compare our new turbo against. This is the HKS GT2 7460. The grid life rules allow us to swap the stock turbo for another stock Mitsubishi turbo. In this case, the HKS turbo off of the Evo 10 FQ440. The HKS GT2 turbo is old, hard to find, overpriced and famously fragile. So I would not recommend that you go with this turbo unless you were under the exact same rule set I was building the car for. Do you want me to talk like I'm optimistic about it? <laughs> We've combined the HKS Turbo with an Artec cast manifold. Artec is an Australian company that makes legit go fast parts used on very fast time attack cars. If you were after kilowatts, it works. It's working. Daddy. <laughs> Daddy. It's working. Now, we needed to reduce back pressure as much as possible. Using Artec's 3.5 inch O2 housing and their 3.5 inch cap back, Ron fabbed up a 3.5 inch downpipe for me because these really do not exist for sale. Nobody does three and a half inch exhausts for these cars. I just, I don't see a three inch being a restriction. We're not, we'll see. And guess what? It worked. It gained 12 horsepower over the three inch, which is nothing to sneeze at if you're looking for every horsepower. I stand corrected, it does help. We dyno the car on a Dynacom dyno just to get a comparison that wasn't a Mustang dyno, and it made 455 horsepower. But if you're looking to spend money on an Evo and make it much, much faster on track, forget all this horsepower business. You want SSB billet uprights. They not only reduce weight compared to the OEM knuckles, but they also allow you to dramatically lower an Evo while keeping reasonably stock suspension geometry, which is essential. They are a game changer. They cost an arm and a leg, but they are worth a second or more on track, and it's best to get used to the way that they make your Evo handle sooner rather than later and develop your chassis handling around these. We installed SSB caster plates at the same time, and I also got yet another set of advans for the Evo, the new RG4 in 18 by 10 plus 35. We trimmed some weight by removing the AC system, 30 pounds that we just took off that was hanging at the very front of the car, but increased weight by changing the titanium 3-inch 
for a stainless three and a half inch. Not that bad, honestly. 10 pounds right at the very bottom of the car. We weighed the car with me and race garb and it's 3,278 pounds with driver, which is not shabby for a street class Evo. For reference, that's about what a stock Evo weighs without driver. Because I knew that seat time was getting murdered by my catch can issues, I increased valve cover ventilation, going to a pair of dash 12 and dash 10 drain lines. My buddy Andrew built a new under the hood custom catch can for me, which we hoped would work better now that we had large enough lines that crankcase pressure would be reduced. Spoiler, this did not work. We also installed ARP extended studs, which I should have been running a long time ago. Our return to VIR showed that all of these mods have been for a good reason. We ran a 202 flat. Then we went from Florida to Alaska again. My third SE front lip. I've cracked both sides of the one that's currently on my car. The downsides of building a track car reared their ugly head. This 10 to 1 compression block is tuned to run basically exclusively on E85. 93 octane, if I could even find it out west, is too low combustion to really run safely at this compression with this tune. So I had to drive the car very gently for the entirety of our 10,000 mile trip. Yet another reason to stay stock block for a car like this. My $400 lip, I guess that's what I get for being vain. A few final bits of prep for grid life include what I think is my most genius mod to this car. And it's not my idea. A marine scavenge pump that I installed below my catch cam. So we've got a pressure switch here that is hooked up to a boost line. So when this sees about four PSI of boost or more, it sends a signal to a relay that in turn sends a signal to the pump. And that is the pump cycling on. It'll be pumping oil out and back into the block. We then got the car wrapped by illusion wraps with an advanced auto livery. The whole goal was to make it look like an aggressive race car. I think the car will always look best white on white, but this livery matched my then mentality of aggressively chasing dominance on the racetrack, so I have no regrets. Speaking of dominance on the track, the Evo went on to set the record at Grid Life Gingerman for street class, and the scavenge pump system worked, which shocked me. Holy cow, I think that I'm actually gonna be able to turn laps this weekend. These successes were tempered by a familiar failure, the destruction of my second six speed. Fourth gear broke oh. again, which meant we would definitely be going five speed. You're gonna be getting the, uh, the PAR fourth gear, double synchro fourth gear. You are getting the JDM .825 fifth gear. This is the holy grail fifth gear for an Evo. This is an oil pan from a company called Infinite Evo in New Zealand. We put on the ultimate wet sump oil pan for the 4G63, the Infinite Evo oil pan, which features an external oil regulator, which dumps excess oil from the oil pump into the oil pan. This, in addition to our return line from the catch can and our AccuSump, means our oil sump is getting fed as much oil as it could ever want. I strongly recommend the Infinite Evo oil pan for anybody who takes their Evo to the racetrack with any frequency. We replaced the turbo access intercooler with a very light piece of kit from Plasma Man, also based out of Australia. My third time at Mid-Ohio saw me take my second win and track record of the season and break my fifth SE front lip. For this event, I had my ultimate catch can, built once again by my buddy Andrew. This catch can features a massive capacity, something like two liters and bigger lines than last time for more efficient oil flow. And now we've come to the sad ending of this long build, for now of course. At my third Grid Life event of 2022, I did win. However, the HKS turbo breathed its last and sent pieces of compressor wheel into the intercooler and oil pan. After swapping back to a stock turbo and cleaning out my intercooler, I found that the motor did have some slight knock. Then, last year, my garage flooded. The interior is a little bit worse for wear. Yeah, that hurts pretty bad. So how much have I actually spent on this money pit up to this point? Well, too much. From the records I can find, 
$75,387. I've certainly left out some expenses over the last 10 years, and this figure is not taking into account the tens of thousands of dollars I've spent on consumables. But if you count all the stuff I've had sponsored over the years, it is a slightly more reasonable $65,733. i am also not counting the cost of the car, because as I said at the beginning, I didn't pay for it. But even still, you can do it cheaper than this, even including the cost of buying an Evo. I've done a lot of stuff twice, or three times, or in the case of front lips, five times. If you want to build this car 95% of the way that I've built it, you could do it for much cheaper, even without the sponsorships. So here's my formula for a fast and relatively affordable street class Evo 8 or 9. Start with a 5-speed. You don't need the MR even though the name sounds cool. If you're stuck with a stock turbo like I was, I recommend you do a cast header from Artec or FP and a 3.5 inch exhaust from Artec, then E85 and the fueling mods that go with it, boost control, and a tune. The MAP lower intercooler pipe is easy horsepower, and upper pipes will help not have boost leaks. This should get you 380-390 wheel horsepower on a Mustang Dyno on a stock EVO 9 long block. EVO 8s don't have variable valve timing and have a worse turbo, so swap to an EVO 9 turbo if you're allowed and consult your tuner on the value of my back. Cams are probably not needed on the stock turbo with such low boost, but this could be a question for your tuner. You will probably need to do a straight cut fourth gear, but if you're okay with letting your stocker break at some point, you can risk it. The high compression block was worth 30 horsepower on the dyno, but is that worth the seven-ish thousand dollars it will cost you? Not to mention the oil control you'll have to deal with after you go to a built bottom end? I'm not so sure, especially because you'll definitely want to spend that money on suspension, wheels, tires, and brakes. Again, the SSB uprights are game changers, and once you have them, tune a set of Fortune Auto 510s or 520s around them. I would also recommend the white line rear sway bar. You'll want track brake pads, and you may have noticed that I've never changed my stock Brembo calipers. It's simply not necessary in my experience. Bigger brakes might help reduce temp over the course of a session, but I don't think Evos at this horsepower level should be run over long sessions anyways, because heat builds in the drivetrain and things start to break. High temp brake fluid is essential, as are braided steel brake lines, and two-piece rotors like the Giro Discs are nice to have. Keeping stock Brembos means that you can continue to run 17-inch wheels, so you have options with wheel size. I think a 10-inch is the minimum you want to run width-wise for 255 tires, and you'll probably want something plus 22 offset in order to avoid touching suspension components, so you'll have to savage your fenders. By now, you're probably pulling enough G that you're worried about your motor, so hit up Infinite Evo in New Zealand and get their beautiful zinc-plated oil pan. Cusco front diff and TRE rear diff mods are game changers and will drop your lap times by seconds. At this point, you're going so fast that you're being flung out of the seat, so you'll want a bucket seat and five or six point harnesses, and you'll have to mount the harnesses to something. Either an auto power half cage, which I had fabbed to include this harness bar, or a full weld-in cage if you're not really keeping this as a street car anymore. And that's about $44,000 give or take, including the cost of the car, which I've priced at about $22,000. For this price, I think a good driver should be just sub to a VIR full course, easily capable of podiuming at grid life street class events, dominating NASA or SECATT, and so on. It is the perfect Evo, in my opinion. Oh my god, thank god I'm finally done with the set. Sorry I'm late, Mark, what'd I miss? Not much. There's a whole lot more that needs to get done. Okay, all right. One more time. Is that finger tight? Nice. There's oil all over it. <laughs> yeah, let's get this thing running by March. We can do it. If you believe we can, buddy, I believe we can. <laughs>